JL Audio's D108 from their Dominion line. Eight inch subwoofer, sealed enclosure, super small. Retails for about 1100 bucks to 1200 bucks, depending on the finish. Ash finish for 1100 bucks, gloss finish is $1,200. And before I go any further, I also want to give a quick shout out to the member of my Patreon group who loaned this subwoofer out to me for testing. So thank you, you know who you are. Just to give you a relative size reference, here you go. I think I have a normal sized head. Doesn't seem like it's too large, doesn't seem too small. So normal sized head compared to this subwoofer. Subwoofer does a good job for bass output, primarily in the mid bass region, not necessarily in the low bass region, but that's not really a surprise given its size and also the fact that it's not ported. You don't have to have a ported configuration to get low. You can do that through DSP as long as you have two things, power availability and excursion, because when you're boosting the low end, you need to be able to move pretty far in and out, and you also need heat dissipation. Now, that doesn't seem to really be an issue with this particular subwoofer, at least in my listening sessions. JL specifies the negative 3 dB point at 29 hertz on the low end, but that is gonna vary with the output. When listening to the subwoofer at lower volumes, and I just wanna specify, I'm talking about 80 decibels at about three meters away in my listening room with the subwoofer corner loaded, so put into the corner. The extension got down into the mid 20s, but when I started to go above that volume, that extension was lessened and lessened and lessened and you really were left with more mid bass, that 50 hertz to 80 hertz punch from the subwoofer. And I did use these with a couple different pair of bookshelf speakers, and I crossed them anywhere from about 80 to 100 hertz, because I wanted to see just how good this thing would work if I wanted to cross it up at 100 hertz. If you're using an eight inch subwoofer, you might actually be using smaller bookshelf speakers and really would benefit from making sure that your crossover isn't the standard 80 hertz, maybe 100 hertz, maybe 120 hertz, especially if you're using a bookshelf speaker that has something like a five and a quarter inch midwoofer. You really wanna take the stress off that speaker and in using a smaller subwoofer like this, that allows you to get a little bit more extension, but that increases your dynamic range as well. So that impact, that thump, that output capability that you want may not be super, super low in frequency, but it's gonna free up your bookshelf speakers from having to provide that content and it's gonna provide more detail more dynamic range. So let's take a look at the data and you'll see what I'm talking about. These are anechoic measurements at one meter. I was targeting about 65 decibels in this black line and you can see the extension F3. Okay, JL specs at about negative 3 dB of 29 Hertz. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty reasonable depending on where you draw the average. As you increase the output and go to about 85, 86, 87 decibels, that F3 point still remains about the same. And I'd say that you are maybe trailing off a little bit on the low end. It's kind of hard to say for sure. I'm not really so sure that you are so much at this particular output volume at about 85 decibels at one meter. But when I maxed out the volume to see what the maximum SPL capability for the subwoofer was, in red is the frequency response. Instead of just cutting off the low end, it also cuts off below about, I'd say about 80 Hertz. This area right here is no longer flat right through here. It's trended down and then it drops off a little bit more here. So it kind of does some, some different things in terms of frequency response than I would expect. And when I say that, the reason is because in some of my other tests of similar size subwoofers, they may not cut so much of this 80 hertz region. They may cut, you know, I don't know, maybe around 50 or 40 hertz or something like that. But the other thing that they do is this right here is super steep. It's significantly more rolled off at the highest output volume for some of those other subwoofers. You can go back and watch those reviews if you want to, but this is kind of what I've seen in that trend. And the JL doesn't appear to be doing that here. It's not sacrificing a whole lot of low end in order to give you higher output, which I find nice, frankly, for, for a lack of better words. That's nice that they're doing that, that they're not saying, well, we're not gonna give you anything below 20 Hertz anymore, or we're not gonna give you below 30 Hertz anymore. We're just gonna pad this frequency response. And in this case though, I will say that it might make it a little bit tougher to align your mains if your crossover region is gonna be around 80 Hertz. You might just wanna kinda of keep that in mind. If you run into issues where it sounds like the upper mid bass is a little bit hotter, if you were to cross this over at 100 Hertz or maybe 120 Hertz, 
that could also be why. So make sure that you take the time to position this subwoofer in a way that makes sense for your room and your listening level. You may never get to this red point. You may never get to 95 decibels at one meter equivalent in your room. You may stay down here, and in which case you're gonna be fine. But otherwise, just kind of keep this graphic in mind where there is some limiting going on with this frequency response at the highest output volume. Speakers never exist in a vacuum. And I don't know that I've ever said, I want this speaker and I'm not gonna compare it to anything else. So I think it makes more sense for me to provide you with some comparisons of data to some of the other subwoofers that I've measured recently. So what I've chosen just kind of for size reasons is the Monoprice THX8, which is on the left, and the SVS 3000 Micro, which is on the right, the JL Audio D108 that I'm reviewing in this video is in the center. So you kind of get an idea of the different sizes between these subwoofers. And what I'm showing you here is the frequency response of each of those subwoofers. JL Audio is in black, SVS is in red, and the Monoprice 8 is in blue. That's also worth mentioning that the JL again is around 1100 bucks, the SVS is around 900 bucks, and this mono price is about 250 to 350, depending on the price when you see this video, because it fluctuates a lot, I've noticed. The mono price has significantly less bass output than the SBS and the JL. Now, looking at this, I would say at this particular volume level, at around this 85 decibel mark, the JL seems to be both a little bit more linear. And you see this, this response is just a little bit more linear and it has a little bit more bass extension. So at around 15 Hertz, you're talking about two to three decibels more for the JL. The SVS though has higher frequency extension because I've got this set up in its bypass mode. So there's no LFE mode enabled. Whereas the JL by default apparently has this frequency response, even when the low pass filter is bypassed. So that's also something to kind of keep in mind. In short, the SVS and the JL both do much better than the mono price. And I think that the JL ekes out a win just in terms of its lower frequency extension. And in my opinion, it's better linearity, but I could see the case being made for the SVS. So now let's switch over to group delay. Same colors again, JL in black, SVS in red, mono price in blue. JL being a sealed subwoofer is inherently gonna have lower group delay, but I am surprised to see that it doesn't have more group delay than it does because my assumption is that they're running some pretty significant DSP to get the low frequency response boosted up given the very small enclosure. But when you look at the SBS, you can see that the SBS has at 20 Hertz, let's see, that's about 30 milliseconds compared to 80 milliseconds. So the SBS at 20 Hertz has 50, is that right? 50 milliseconds more group delay than the JL audio subwoofer. In the real world, I can't tell you that that's gonna mean a whole lot to you, but I can say that when you have higher group delay, things like matching mains to your subwoofers become more of a problem, especially when the group delay ramps up through the crossover region. If you were trying to cross over at around maybe, I don't know, let's say 50 Hertz or something like that, that's very high group delay. So now you've gotta make sure not only that the phase angle is right while it's hitting this phase angle on group delay alone, but you've also got to make sure that your time delay for your mains is synced up enough to the delay within the subwoofer itself. Let's talk about maximum output capability in terms of the CEA 2010A specification. You can find these results on my website, but what I've done is I've gone ahead and filtered down to these three main subwoofers that I've just been talking about. And we can see that the data is given to you in tabular format. But I also like to do a little graph because graphs, frankly, in my opinion, are just a little bit easier to read through. So here we go. JL is gonna be in blue, SBS in red, mono price in yellow. The JL uh, looks at like 20 Hertz. It's definitely winning out over these other two subs. At, it's about 80 decibels at 20 Hertz. For the SBS, it's about 76 or so. So yeah, we're at about four to five decibels difference on the JL versus the SBS. And then the mono price is down here at about 73 decibels. If we go up a little bit higher, we can see that the trend continues where the JL wins out. But there is a little area where the mono price wins out at around 31 Hertz. So there's gonna be just a little bit more output capability for the mono price at 31 Hertz at 93 versus 91. So about two decibels. And then the SBS 
starts to pull ahead and wins at above about 63 hertz. The D108, surprisingly, does really good numbers. I mean, it's almost five decibels above the SBS, which runs two eight inch subwoofers instead of the single like the JL does. So in terms of the CEA 2010A data, the JL also wins out here. Now, it shouldn't really be a huge surprise that the JL is doing better because its price is about $400 or so more, give or take, depending on which model you get, than the SBS that I'm also talking about in this video. So you kind of have to keep that in mind, but I would say that one common critique of JL Audio is that they are overpriced. A lot of people say that about JL Audio. I can tell you that JL Audio has fantastic engineering, got a great engineering staff. I mean, some of the conversations that I've had with some of those guys over the past maybe 10 to 15 years of me being in this hobby, I've always been really impressed with the information that they provide. And I feel like they get a bad rep just because their prices are, yeah, they are relatively high, but they have a really good product and there's a lot of true engineering behind it. They're not just buying parts from some manufacturer overseas and then slapping their label on it like a lot of other manufacturers do. That really wraps things up for me here. The JL does good. I think it warrants its price in terms of objective performance. And if you're interested in buying it, I believe that you will have to go to a JL Audio dealer to purchase this particular model, but you can search around online. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing to this channel because that does help me out. And I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace. Oh, I almost forgot to say this, this microphone thing. Y'all like that? My daughter got that for me for my birthday. So shout out to my daughter. I just wanted to thank her. Uh, I love you, daughter. Not you people out there. Don't be weird. All right. Talk to y'all later. Peace.